Welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Pfeffer, a professor at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, an author of 16 books on a range of topics, including the topic of my oversubscribed MBA class and this podcast, Power. Every other week, I talk to someone about their path to power and provide you with practical guidance about how to accelerate your career. Today's guest is Dr. Rudolf F. Krug, otherwise known as Rudy Krug, who I've known since 2004. Rudy Krug is an African-American man with an incredibly distinguished career in education. After serving as a teacher and a principal and an assistant superintendent and superintendent in the Tacoma, Washington school system, he was hired by the now infamous Rudy Giuliani to be chancellor of New York City schools, where he oversaw a million students and 100,000 teachers and a budget of 12 to $13 billion. After falling out with the famous Rudy Giuliani, I met him when he came to the Stupsky Foundation, which was an educational foundation where he provided guidance to school districts around the country. He then served as superintendent of Miami-Dade County. He then served as chief education officer, the first chief education officer for the state of Oregon. Had Hillary Clinton ever been elected president, Dr. Crew would have been probably secretary of education. Each episode is focused on a particular topic. And today's topic with Dr. Crew is going to be on the price of power. And to set this up, let us take a look and step back at the situation currently confronting not only Rudy Giuliani, but a lot of other people who have fallen into the Donald Trump orbit. One of the things that happens when people seek power is they sometimes are so interested in and desperate to be close to power that they wind up associating with and linking up with people who in many instances get them into trouble. This is certainly true for the people who've been associated with Trump. Trump, I think, may be elected president. Meanwhile, many of the people associated with Trump have lost their law licenses, are going to jail. In the case of Rudy Giuliani's case, he's facing a $148 million defamation payment to the two African-American women he defamed who are in Georgia. Rudy Crew has seen a lot of this up close. And so I want, with Rudy Crew to explore the issue around how do you avoid hooking up with the wrong people? How do you know that you're going to get in trouble? What is the wisdom that you can share with us, having watched this play out, not only with Rudy Giuliani, but with a bunch of other people? So welcome to the podcast, Rudy Crew, and it's nice to see you. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you, Jeff, and thank you very much for having me. So how do people get into trouble in their pursuit of power? Well, I mean, there are many roads into that forest. Some of it has to do with ego. The very fact that there are stakes that have long, long, long ramifications for a person's future. They either will or will not commit to a body of work or some action that they take while in the job. And it's predicated on me first. It's not predicated on the organization or the needs of children in my case, but it's predicated on their own needs. And so, you know, greed plays a big part in that. A second alleyway into this is that there are an awful lot of people who fundamentally are, you know, sort of outmatched for the challenge. And they get themselves into problems by virtue of then having to compensate for the lack of ideas that symbolism is as good as substance. And people decide that for political purposes and for staying power, that they ultimately will just simply go along to get along. They'll symbolize the idea of the ideal of leadership rather than lead. And I guess the third one is that I would say is that there are people who get into trouble just by virtue of joining the wrong crowd, that there are plenty of folks in the political realm who have an agenda, and that agenda oftentimes involves people being cooperative 
And again, if not cooperative, it could be sycophantic. And so again, you find yourself in this situation where people get into trouble because they simply go along to get along. They raise no objection, even though it may be against their own core values, and they ultimately get themselves into a major set of circumstances from which they cannot retreat because the retreat is even more difficult than it was to get in in the first place. So they are landlocked at that point. I think that's a great answer. On the one hand, I think people do want to be associated with people in power because your career is tied oftentimes to their success. You see this where executives will bring their own colleagues along up with them as they rise up the organization. So it's not like you don't want to be associated with people in power. How can you recognize better, given the fact that everybody has a certain amount of ego, et cetera, how can you recognize the danger signs that suggest that you're not going to be in a very good position? Well, one of the danger signs, frankly, is the one that we have been all raised with, which is just simply a visceral reaction to whether or not this is good or bad. If you have that kind of reaction, then it's worthy of dialing in a little deeper and finding out why this is feeling the way that it's feeling. A second way of being able to determine that this is a, a bad place is if you smell that there are quid pro quos in this that are either explicit or implicit, and those quid pro quos come with a price that is extremely high, either politically very high, financially very high, or if it's too good to be true. It's overly rewarding. It just comes with way more remuneration than you thought you'd even be able to get out of the situation. Everybody understands quid pro quos. It's just when it's time to pay them, that's where the danger begins to lie. And the third thing I would say is I've noticed, at least in my tenure, my career, I noticed that when it was going to get bad, it always was foreshadowed by somebody or something. It didn't start raining like a thunderstorm breaks out in the summer overnight, right? It didn't happen immediately. It happened with a runway. There's something that precipitated the actual problem. And you have to really pay keen attention to your environment to know that this should not be understood as casual business as usual moments. There's a statement, there's a problem in what has happened or what was said that I need to really deeply pay attention to. Can you give me a specific example of that from your own career, maybe either with Rudy Giuliani or in Florida or in Oregon? Yeah, there's a ton of them. The budget for New York City public schools, as an example, much like the budget in every school system, goes before a number of governmental bodies. In my case, it went before the city council and the two chambers of the city council. Every time it went, there were questions that you had to come to the city council meeting and respond to. When I would go to the city council, many of the politics that were statewide or nationally played out in that arena. And I knew that there were things that I needed to basically pay attention to that many of these city politicians were paying attention to. One of them was how much per capita is being spent on education. And I knew that there were a number of legislators in the city council who were angry, upset about the number of dollars that get spent on public education in New York City in particular, but generally nationally as well. And they were asking questions about when are we going to cut the budget? Why are we not firing more teachers? Why are we not firing principals? You don't need a principal at every school. There were countless examples of that that I had seen early on in the year, long before the budget was required to come before them. So knowing that this was a major political rallying call for many people on the city council, I knew that I'd have my work cut out for me in being able to head that off if it was possible. It was not possible. There were legislators from Staten Island, for example, who essentially wanted to remove the arts programs that I had put in place. They wanted to remove literacy programs 
because their kids could read already. And why are we spending money on immigrant kids? And why are we spending all these dollars on books that these children are never going to read? And on and on and on. So in many ways, the discourse of today regarding book banning and so forth, those things were teed up through some of these activities and these conversations 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. It, it's been in the pipeline for a very long time. It's been a political wish list for a number of folks. And so it constantly keeps coming up. I knew I had to fight that battle and there was no heading it off, but it was one of these moments where, as I say, if you can just anticipate, if you can get ahead of where the problem lies, what do people see as a problem? I didn't see it as a problem, but they did. And the question of how you answer it becomes equally as important as that you answer it. I had an awful lot of times when I can be somewhat, shall I say, sarcastic, and I don't even mean to be, but it doesn't help. And therefore, I stepped in my own soup by virtue of answering questions about literacy, for example, that were on the face of them actually just throwaway political questions, but I didn't have, in some cases, the maturity, frankly, to just simply stay away and not take the bait. I took the bait and answered them in a, I won't say a caustic way, but at least in a way that was not politically sound, and that cost me some, that cost me some votes. Thank you for that. I really love your earlier comment, which I want to not pass over, about this issue of you can sometimes tell you're in trouble if you're getting paid too much if you're being over-rewarded. That was the case at Enron. Actually, the chairman of the audit committee at Enron is the late Robert Jedeke, the associate dean who hired me into my job at Stanford. And one of the things he told me when he joined the Enron board was, wow, they're paying us a lot of money. And they were overpaid considering the size of the company and considering the responsibilities of that board. And that was an example of over-rewarding because they were being over-rewarded for a reason. Jeff Skilling and Andy Fastow were going to pay the board members well so the board members would not have much incentive to ask what the hell was going on at, <laughs> what the hell was going on at Enron. Right, right. The other thing your comment reminds me of is that I think you can oftentimes understand if you're going to pay a huge price for power by looking at your predecessor. So I don't know who your predecessor was in New York City or in Miami-Dade. You had no predecessors because you were the first chief education officer for the state of Oregon. But the trouble I've seen people get into, and I want you to comment on this, is people will say, yes, everybody who's worked with Donald Trump has been treated badly. Many of them have gone to jail, but I'm going to be different. Yes, I see, as I walk down the hall of the New York City uh, headquarters office for the school district, the pictures of all of these past superintendents, many of them who didn't last, well, one of them died of a heart attack very soon after taking the job, many of them who didn't last very many years, but I'm going to somehow be different. So this issue that somehow what has happened to your predecessor is not going to happen to you is a seductive thing that I think often gets people into trouble. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right, Jeff. And, and I also think that when you see what has happened to your predecessor and you have that feeling of, you know what? Yeah, but that was someone else. That was a different time. That's when I'm saying to you, it becomes important to check in with yourself because you're leading with your ego. You're leading through your ego. You're already starting off, you think, in a power position. In fact, you've ceded power the second you start believing that. This is the lot you have drawn. You will, in fact, have that same kind of an outcome. And the conditions that brought that person down are still present. The very first day you step foot in the job, those conditions are still present. They didn't leave, even though the person left. Those conditions didn't leave. So I think it becomes important for people to check themselves, to really, you know, sort of, hey, I'm excited that I got a job. I'm so excited. I'm going to be the CEO or the superintendent or the chancellor or whatever. But at some point, you really need somebody preferably somebody who loves you and cares for you, but you need somebody who will say, you know what, pipe down, get a grip here. You got a job that is laced with 
potholes and possibilities of being an abject failure. That's what you got. And you're going to be paid for it, but it requires strategy. It requires ego strength, not egocentrism. The power to say no, the power to understand, the power to not agree, right? To not go against that visceral, guttural feeling that, hey, this is just bad. It's bad business. One of the things that I remember you telling my class is that you knew that in these jobs, you would have almost by definition, a limited time. And therefore, if you were going to make change in New York City or in Miami-Dade County later on, you knew that you were not going to have a long, long time horizon. And so therefore, that affected how you approach that work. That's exactly right. I think when you get the job, be prepared to lose the job. That would be the first of many commandments, right? Be prepared to lose it. And by losing it, I mean, it may be gradual, but the fact of the matter is every decision you make comes with a consequence, and that consequence generally is added up in political terms. And the accumulation of that is what I would say to you is the quid pro quo. That, that's the giant quid pro quo. It's the one that you're going to ultimately pay permanently for in that sense that you will be removed. I've removed people from their jobs who were spouses of board members, friends of board members, people who were in the political or the business sector who had a contract or a deal, you know, through a, a more surreptitious means, and I removed the contract or stopped the contract. Well, that comes with a consequence. And even if you withstand that one event, it accumulates in the minds of others and they make you pay. And so my advice has always been, you know what, pay the price. Don't do the wrong thing, but just understand that by doing the right thing, you will, in fact, still accrue a consequence. There's no good deed that goes unpunished. I love that. Do you have any other advice about what we've been talking about, avoiding some of the prices of power or, or how to figure out how to navigate these political situations, which are, they exist, by the way, not just in the public sector or in education, but they exist inside companies as well. That's exactly right. What other advice would you give people based upon your insights and experience? I think, Jeff, that this whole idea of just being good at your work, just being doggedly good about the X's and O's, lead by the kind of quality work you provide, the kind of vision you provide, the kind of excitement there is by others in the company who see your visionary perspective as being a drawing card. It's rich, and that richness is culturally fulfilling. It helps the culture to move past some of those tough spots that you get into just because you have to make some tough decisions. I remember having to make budget cuts, and those budget cuts were going to be pretty deep. There's goodwill in the culture if, in fact, there are other things that you did or have done traditionally that made people feel like this was not a vendetta. This was not a gotcha. This was, unfortunately, a bad fiscal year in the state of California, and we had to make budget cuts. But the fact of the matter is there was humanism brought to the table. There was a sense of honor brought to the table. There was uh, transparency and, and a sense of humility brought to this, that no one enjoyed watching people walk out the door and be without a job. So you can create a cultural wave of positivity and yet do some things that are very, very, very unpopular and sometimes very uncomfortable. But I think that first portion is really important. Don't think of yourself as a monolith. Don't think of yourself as being, hey, the sun rises and sets because I'm here. No, the sun only sets because you're there. <laughs> it does not rise. It rises because the organization is committed to doing something that is completely compelling and very visionary and very helpful to other people, that this is bigger than you. 
And you need to actually feel that and represent that and lead from that place. And then when you have to hit the tough spots, the skids are going to happen. But when you have to hit it, people remember that you were a decent human being, that this was an enormously powerful moment in the organization that you passed that test. And I think the final thing I would talk about in this issue of the price of power is to remember why you're doing what you're doing. One of the stories that I loved in the New York Times article about you was how you would visit the classrooms and talk to the children. And you see in many organizations, I see this now in healthcare systems, where the CEO of healthcare systems never go into the hospitals. And so they forget that they're actually serving patients or school superintendents or corporate CEOs who never go with the retail executives who don't go into the stores or school superintendents who actually don't go into the classroom. I remember the story of you with the young kid doing the math problem. Right. And that's, I think, a a good way to end. Why don't you tell that story? Yeah, this was a case where I walked into a classroom. It was a day that I needed perspective, actually, because I had just been kind of called on the carpet by Rudy at the time. And I decided the only way to, as you say, remember why I'm even here is let me go back to a school. Let me go. I was a good teacher. I love teaching. I certainly love children. So let me go into that soil for a second. Went out to a school. And as I walked into the classroom of one of these schools, I looked down. I saw a young kid doing a math problem. And he was erasing like mad. He was just, he had the back of his pencil going over time. And I looked down and I said to him, son, I said, what what are you doing? He said, I got this math thing, and I was about the fourth grade. He said, I I don't understand it. I don't get it. And I said, well, son, you stay at it. You'll get it. Whereupon I walked around the rest of the classroom and started on my way out. And when I started on my way out, the same young man grabbed my coattail, my suit coat, and he said, who are you anyway? I said, well, I'm Dr. Crew. I'm the chancellor of the school system here. He said, are you kidding me? Do you like your job? I said, yeah, I like my job. Sometimes it can be pretty tough. He said, are you any good at it? I said, well, there are days I think I'm pretty good, and then there are days that I'm not so good. And he looked up at me as only a fourth grade, wry-minded, beautiful child could do. And he said, well, you stay at it. You'll get it. (laughs) That's a wonderful story. And I think the advice of staying grounded in the work that you're doing is advice that I think, because everyone will pay some price to be in a powerful position or to associate with people in positions of power. But staying focused on what the work is that you are about will help you as you have to pay that price. Absolutely right. Our guest today has been Dr. Rudy Crew, who is not only a fabulous educator, but a very good friend. Rudy, thank you so much for being on the Pfeffron Power Podcast. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's been an honor. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast, where every other week we talk to an accomplished individual about their path to power and the practical lessons for you. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the podcast on any of your favorite sources and buy my most recent book on power, Seven Rules of Power. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and jeffreypfeffer.com. Pfeffer on Power is a production of Stanford University and University FM.